What's up guys, Speed here, and today we're going to be talking about the 5 most important rules for the offlane, 5 things you should be focusing on as an offlane player to improve. Right, because each rule in Dota is quite a bit different, so in this video I just want to be giving my main opinion on what offlaner is doing wrong. I've been playing offlane for a long time, it's been my main role for a while, so yeah, here's my tips. The offlane is no place for the weak, and this is why at GameLeap.com we have hundreds of pro guides covering the most powerful offlane heroes so you can start carrying your games from Dota's most notoriously tough lane. To master the tricks of the pros, check out the discount link in the description of this video and start dominating your games from the offlane role immediately. So the first and probably most important thing to understand as an offlaner that I think actually a lot of people lack is occupying difficult farm and the concept of defending towers. Now this is really really difficult because very often what I see from offlane players is that they win their lane, right? Because they pick like some legion, you know, a lot of offlaners focus on winning lane and I respect that. But that happens, ends up coming as a result, is that they just run around and that's it. They just chase and chase and chase. And guys, that does not work. You cannot just chase kills all game. Like yes, setting up plays and things like smokes or wrapping behind a tower or, you know, just running at the safe lane carry is fantastic, especially if it works out and you're ahead right? or you do it around vision. I don't know, something that would make it calculated. But more often than not, what you have to understand is when you're ahead, sometimes the best thing to do as an offlane player is defend towers and actually take the difficult farm, right? So let's say you're playing someone like a timber saw, right? Recently, I was watching a 33 replay and a great example of this came up. He was crushing his game, right? It was the VP versus Alliance series, crushed his lane and they had very little counters to him. So what did he do? He took the hard farm, defended top when they went for a top push and then instantly rotated mid to shut down the following mid push, right? Extremely fast, completely negated all of their plays and that was high impact. And you could do the same on a lot of heroes, Underlord, Beastmaster, uh, Doom, it doesn't matter, right? A lot of these heroes have these capabilities of playing in difficult areas because they are very hard to kill and have good D push. And so yeah, if you're really confused on what you need to be doing as an offlaner, I'd recommend you start asking yourself the question, what does my safe laner want this game? If I have a PL and I'm just running around chasing kills and actually taking fights around the PL, am I helping him? Or am I actually causing him to take bad fights? Because honestly guys, farming sometimes, and when I say farming, I, I mean like actually effectively pushing in creep waves that create map pressure or at least defend towers often create a lot more space than running around and killing people. So what I recommend you guys do is check out your recent replay. Did I just get ahead and run around or even when I was behind that I just keep trying to fight? Ask yourself this question because often playing more so around objectives and pushing in effective waves is a lot better and more reliable to gaining a Mamar as an offlaner than anything else. Next up on the list we have last hitting, and I know this might sound very similar to what I just said in terms of farming, but I want to make a very clear point to a lot of the low MR offlane players. Hear me out on this one. You have to look at your lane and ask yourself, why do I consistently have lower CS than the safe laner? Guys, I've watched a lot of low MR pubs, and I mean a lot. Maybe more than anyone else. Like, j just pure replays. Maybe, right? And I can tell you, that the majority of games, for whatever reason, off laners have less CS than the safe laners. Even if it's just a pure 2v2 situation, the safe laner could even have died once or twice. And I think the reason actually mainly comes down to the fact that offlane players have this pure mindset of fight, 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 trade, trade, trade. Guys, even if you're an offlane player, you have to, if you're trying to get to the highest level, get the CS as well. In fact, a lot of trades are based upon, you know, okay, the enemy's going for a last hit, now I can catch him off guard, or hey, the wave is pushed in, or I got an item advantage. Things that last hits and creep manipulation actually apply to. Like, last hitting is more important in trading than actually hitting the opponent a lot of the time. And so really look at your game. I want anyone to talk to me about this in the Discord. Like, do you notice the same pattern? Go to just a bunch of low more replays. This could be like 3K and below, whatever you consider low. It doesn't matter. And check if you notice the same pattern. And I'm only pointing this out because I even see melee offlaners. I have seen Sand Kings and Underlords, not Night Stalker, not by Quelling Blade. Why are you not buying Quelling Blade? You have to get the last hits. You can't just auto attack them down. In fact, a lot of offlaner spikes are at level 3, 5 with an item or two. It's not just right away, and I think a lot of people get this wrong and confuse it with like, oh, I crushed this safe laner in 
this matchup. So then the next time they get into a game, they're like, oh, it must have been from level one instead of actually looking for a legitimate spike that comes off levels, items, or creep advantage. Next up on the list, we have something that actually pertains to all roles. Um, I just really want to put it in the offlaner video in particular, because I think offlaners very often control the tempo of the game, want to make a lot of space, and, you know, make things like smoke calls or wrapping on mid, all these advanced plays that, that very often sim around, you know, tempo controllers like, like the Beastmasters of Brewmaster level 6, Pango level 6, Doom, whatever it is. And so yeah, the point's going to be coordination, and the first thing I want to mention is coordination in lane. So recently, I was watching a match when these players were running a Doom and Grimstroke lane, and multiple times I'm like, hey, you could go on them right now, like in my head, I'm like, go, right, like, like go, <laughs> just go. Doom was level 3, he had level 2 Scorcher, and the Grimstroke was also level 3, and had level 2 Ink Spell, like a big spike in lane, and they were not going. And I thought to myself, like, why not? Because then, the minute later, the Doom went, he used the Scorched Earth, he approached the enemy safe laner, did some damage, and then, after that ended, the Ink Swell went in, the Grimstroke went in with the Ink Swell, completely separated. I was just like, if you use your spells together, you're gonna get like 50% more damage just because you'll actually be able to get the full duration, right? A Doom with his Scorched Earth on will be able to get off a Max Ink Swell and actually be able to chase the safe laner down for longer because they won't get to the tower right away. It's one of those things where coordination and, and players think that, oh, it's solo queue, there's no coordination. It doesn't matter. Like, I don't... First of all, the game and the outcome does not care how you feel about how the game and how your ecosystem goes. So you can adjust or lose. And then second off, all it takes is a ping or simply saying like two words, I'm being swelling, go. That's it. If they don't go, they don't go, but you have to try. Because if two divine players played two legend players, a big difference in the lane would simply be their synergy in casting their spells together. And even if an immortal player played a divine player and we shift it up a little bit, that synergy becomes even a little bit more clean. And then they win the trades, right? Because 2v1s are a lot better than 1v1s. And so yes, going into the mid game as well, this also applies, right? You have to understand that when you're trying to use these spikes that a lot of these offlaners have, a Wrath of Nature, the Roar I talked about. You want to use your spikes, right? A lot of safe laners don't have this, right? Any mage, level 6, nothing changes. PA, not much. Lifestealer, not much. Terrorblade, not really. You know, these heroes don't hit spikes as safe laners, but as off laners, more often than not, your ultimate is a big timing to start creating space. So what I recommend you do is you pay attention to these spikes, ask your supports, hey guys, let's smoke. And even if you're like, speed. Like, I legitimately just heard the thought, my supports don't buy smokes. Buy the smoke! Buy the smoke! Buy the smoke! Just buy it! I actually can't stand that offlane players don't buy smokes. It makes no sense. You're a tempo controller who has multiple, like, multiple high damage early game spells, and you can't buy this item that just wins the game. Next up on the list is something a bit broad. It will take a lot of practice, and I would say even studying, to actually fully understand this. Because all I want to say is, at number four, we have understanding fighting. What does this mean? Well, fighting is the most complex thing about Dota. Right? There's like two main sectors to Dota in my opinion. There's farming and there's fighting. A lot of players try to fight to win and that's actually okay because if you're an offlane player, it's often advised, right? Because you're not the hero that's going to scale into the late game and win the game for your team, right? So, so taking the fighting route to win is typically the correct nature for an offlaner, right? As I expressed earlier though, you have to mix it with farming guys. You, you can do a little bit of both and you can push waves to actually make plays a lot better. Going back into the point though, I want to make it clear that there are a few videos out there that talk about fighting and positioning and camera movement, and I recommend you do a little bit of studying into them, right? Because I've watched a lot of players, and I noticed that one big thing that players had the issue of is first off looking at the map for good fights, which could be a big improvement for anyone, casting their spells, which for offlaners, you know, it can be a big deal, and camera movement, right? And why is camera movement so important? Well, a lot of offlaners are specifically AoE heroes, right? We have Tidehunter, Earthshaker, Centaur, right? Axe. Sand King, doesn't matter. There's a ton of offlaners that do a lot of AoE damage, right? Or AoE disable. So what does this entail? Well, what it means is that your camera movement has to be very crisp. And then there's one more component to this that I highly recommend you start thinking about, which is reading enemy movement before you even see them. What does this mean? Well, if you see a faceless void on the front line, where are his supports? Behind him. Of course, they're behind him. It's very obvious, but it's only obvious if you think about it, right? A lot of players, what they'll see is only the Faceless Void, and that's the only thing going through their head. There's Faceless Void. You have to be start considering who's behind Faceless Void, because when you consider who's behind Faceless Void, well, that's when you start getting the two or three man calls or, you know, Sand King stuns on heroes that are burstable, and then the fight instantly ends. And so that's something I've noticed w within myself when I was learning offlane 
Um, I remember for a while I was playing offlane Void when that was popular and in particular I, I remember being consistently able to hit multi-man Kronos by simply going in second in the fights and you might have heard a lot of casters talk about this Void is a hero that likes to go in second and that's something I realized so what I did was I had some patience I didn't rush my Kronos I went in second and reliably reliably this was in the 3k 4k bracket I could hit multi-man Kronos that would win my team the fights and this can apply to a lot of heroes so start thinking about this like where are the people i'm not seeing right do i need to wait a little bit should i go in first and, and try to really think about this for your hero because it changes from hero to hero and that's one of the most difficult parts of dota right if you're a legion how do you know between going for a defensive sort of posturing where you're going to press the attack or just instantly duel how do you know on tide when you should hold ravage or cast it right away right how do you know to not use black hole just so the threat is still there. These are very difficult questions, and it's something you should be paying attention to if you're trying to improve as an offlaner. And last but not least, we have team items. If you're an offlane player, you know that team items are very important. What do I mean by this? Well, you can actually often be the third support or, you know, supporting role in, in terms of items. And what I mean by that is items like pipe. Crimson Guard, Vlad's, even a four staff, Lotus Orb. Once again, I'm sorry that I'm referring to this 33 match, but he was playing Timbersaw and the enemy team had an Invoker, right? Invoker has Cold Snap and buys an Urn, right? Because it was Wex. So he could purge both of them. And this multiple times was able to protect his Faceless Void, who is a hero that if he gets Cold Snap, cannot cast his Time Walk, which is his defensive capability. This one purchase, even though it is obviously great for the Timber as well, so it's just a win-win, is very heads up just for the fact that he was using it on his Void. A lot of players, they don't even consider what their teammates need. And people are asking me, what items should I be buying, Speed? Very often, if you want to know what items to buy, you should actually look at the enemy team. Very often do you not buy items for your own team, but you buy them for the enemy team. Enemy team have a lot of physical damage? Okay, maybe I'll go for a Vlad's or a Force Staff to kite them or a Crimson Guard or a Shiva's. Magical damage? Well, pretty simple. I could go for a pipe or even if I'm crazy enough, another Glimmer Cape. This item is legitimately broken in solo queue. I'll say it a million times. And also, uh, there's another example. I believe he was KPI playing Beastmaster and he went Necro 1, right? So he had a Necro 1, typical Beastmaster stuff. And what do you think he bought next? Necro 2? Well, actually not. He didn't buy a Necro 2. Uh, he actually used the Necro 1 to just get more levels. Abuse the fact that, you know, Beastmaster has an XP gain talent and farms very quickly, as well as does quite a bit of damage with that. And then immediately went for a pipe to counter the enemy team's magical damage. And this allowed them to end the game not long after. It completely boosted up the Medusa that they had on their team, as well as the, I believe, Night Stalker carry. And there was nothing that the enemy team could do. The Medusa all of a sudden had a ton of magical resistance, more HP regen, and the shield, obviously, that it provides. And the game soon after ended. Item purchases on offlaners are very, very difficult. It's the probably the most difficult role to purchase items because you're actually getting farm and very often you have the option to go for utility as your carries will be going for more so DPS or at least a mix. When people are asking me, how should I determine what items to buy? The first thing you should do is go to the pro matches, copy their items. Everyone is overthinking this. You're overthinking items, okay? Eventually, when you hit 6, 7K, I would recommend to start, you know, changing things up and, you know, innovating builds. But until then, it is by far the best idea to focus on other things and copy what pros do. Even if you don't know if it's optimal yet, think, okay, why is it optimal? And I'm going to go it anyway, no matter what, what my game looks like, to test it out and feel if my reasoning was correct. And something like this will help you to understand what team items are important, right? Because you could buy a Crimson Guard and it could seem like they have a lot of physical damage, right? Like, let's say they have a PL. And then all of a sudden, what do you know? You weren't even thinking. They have an Evoker who purges all of the Crimson Guards with one tornado and your item felt useless. So, items are super, super difficult. But yes, as an offlaner, you have to learn how to buy the correct ones. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. I will be putting out more offlane content, hopefully in the future. Help the fellow brothers out, as I understand that this role is sometimes underappreciated. But as you may know, I made a Pudge and Abaddon guide recently. So hopefully you enjoy those and learned quite a bit about the offlane from them as well. And yeah, I genuinely hope I see you in the next video. Peace. The offlane is no place for the weak, and this is why at GameLeap.com we have hundreds of pro guides covering the most powerful offlane heroes so you can start carrying your games from Dota's most notoriously tough lane. To master the tricks of the pros, click on this link right now to take advantage of our special offer for a 25% discount and unlock your unfair advantage.